Well, I, ha I have an opportunity to uh, briefly introduce our, introduce our guest preacher for this morning. Some of you may already know Foster Mann, who is working in Worcester with the Welcoming Alliance for Refugee Ministries. For those of you who have participated as part of our core team or have just come to some of the informational meetings, you might recognize his, his face and his head of hair, for which I am very jealous. Um, but Foster has uh, become a friend of mine over the past year, and he, we have the opportunity to hear from him as he shares uh, a little bit about what he has uh, kind of been impressed with God's word in Isaiah chapter 41 and how it relates to God has called us together as a church. So please welcome Foster. churches and see just how God is at work among them. Uh, and so I'd just like to begin by reading through the passage we're going to be looking at, which is Isaiah 41. Um, so if it's in your Bible, it looks like the page is 587, or you can pull out your phone or just follow along as I read. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. The islands have seen it in fear. The ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. They help each other and say to their companions, be strong. The metal worker encourages the goldsmith. And the one who smooths with the hammer spurs on the one who strikes with the anvil. One says of the welding, it is good. The other nails down the idol so it will not topple. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, I call you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Those you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear. For I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them, and reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them, and the wind will pick them up, and a gale will blow them away. But you will rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and the needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights, and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water, and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar of Asia, the myrtle and the olive, I will set junipers in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together, so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Present your case, says the Lord. 
set forth your arguments, says Jacob King. Tell us, you idols, what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that they may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so we may know that you are gods. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with fear. But you are less than nothing, and your works are utterly worthless. Whoever chooses you is detestable. I have stirred up from one from the north, and he comes. One from the rising sun who calls on my name. He treads on rulers as if they were mortar, and if he were a potter tending the clay. Who told of this from the beginning so we could know? Or beforehand so we could say he was right? No one told of this. No one foretold it. No one heard any words from you. I was the first to tell Zion, look, here they are. I gave to Jerusalem a messenger of good news. I look, but there is no one. No one among the gods to give counsel. No one to give answer when I ask them. See, they are false. Their deeds amount to nothing, and their images are but wind and confusion. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This passage is a long one, and it's poetry, so it can be confusing to follow in a really consistent manner. Um, but at its core, it's an invitation to the people of Israel to respond to what God is doing among them. So I'd like to share a story. One time, there was a football game going on in the Wisconsin Badger Stadium, and it was not going well. Uh, I don't know much about football, but I could tell the teams were dropping balls, the other team was scoring, but the weirdest thing was happening. Despite how badly the team was playing, all the Wisconsin fans in the stadium were still cheering and hollering them on. They were giving standing ovations, they were doing the waves. It was quite bizarre to look at the game that was going on and to see the reaction of the fans. And people weren't able to make sense of it until they realized later that a couple miles down the road in the baseball stadium, there was a game that was going a lot better. And it turned out that all the Wisconsin fans had radio earbuds in. And they were listening to this totally different game, this totally different reality that was going on. And so the actions of the, of the fans are bizarre and make no sense until we realize they were based on a different, better reality. And that is exactly the purpose of this passage is that God is asking his people, which reality are they going to view the world through? Is it the reality of the works of man, of what they can achieve on their own? Or is it the reality of faith in God? Passages such as these are invitations to us. Invitations to learn more about who God is, but also invitations to learn more about ourselves and to learn more about how we can respond to the love of God. And so I kind of think if you really wanted to oversimplify the Bible, you could summarize it all in one sentence. God is establishing his presence among his people. And I'm sure you've noticed that theme's a few times in your long journey through Isaiah so far. Despite the failure of the Israelites to follow God's law, God still promises him a future where they will be in relationship with him where his presence among them will not be missed, and it will be obvious. And so the question that the book of Isaiah poses time and time again is, do you trust in God's promises or in the work of man? And this passage is no different. So the task before us this Sunday and in this sermon is to place ourselves in the story, to ask ourselves that question, and to ask ourselves which reality do we choose to see the world through? And so this journey all starts with the presence of God. And so what does it mean to be in God's presence? That's one of those kind of theological terms that get thrown out sometimes that we scratch our head trying to answer. But in God's presence, we experience who he is. And we can see this just in the first seven verses of 41. One of the first steps in understanding the Bible is understanding the genre, or what type of writing the passage is. And so this passage is a collection of poems that the author uses to describe the reality of God to the Israelites. And being poetry, it can sometimes be hard to understand, but even from the first verse of this chapter, 
we can see that this is connected to Isaiah 40 that I believe you guys have looked at over the last few weeks. If you remember, in Isaiah 40, we keep seeing this word described of cry, pro proclaim, announce the greatness of God, let it be known what God can do. And in this chapter, we see silence, a silence that in the Bible often leads to listening. While chapter 40 tells of the importance of knowing about the greatness and majesty of God, this verse invites us in to experience him. By having silence, it tells us of a time when the noise and the busyness of life will die down and all that remains is experiencing who God is. And so this verse continues to explain this time by describing that people are there to listen. It says three reasons why that will happen within this silence. It's so that people's strength will be renewed, so that they may approach God and speak to him, and so that all may be together at the place of judgment. So what is in common with each of these statements? It's the fact that people will experience God firsthand. And so one approach to try to understand what this experience looks like is doing a deep exegetical analysis, you know, looking at all the words, seeing how the grammar fits, looking at it in the original words. But such an investigation is important, and I did that research preparing, and I'd love to talk about that with people afterwards, but we have to be careful to not miss the weight of what the passage is saying. Pastor Eric shared with me as I was kind of talking to him about getting a feel for the passage ahead of time, and he shared a poem that I think he might have shared with some of you about how sometimes poetry is like a man sitting in a chair. And sometimes we have a tendency to tie the man down, to poke him and prod him and investigate him and try to beat a confession out of him with what that poetry is saying. And we can approach the passage like this, but then we miss having the opportunity to just experience experience the emotions and the feelings that God is inviting us to. And so what is that overwhelming sense that the passage is trying to communicate in these first few verses? I think it's asking an implied question. What is your experience of God? We can see this in kind of verses 2, 3, and 4 where it asks a series of questions. It talks about, you know, the rising of prophets and judges to look after the Israelites. It talks about protecting them in wars and battles. It talks about calling them together in community. And this form of asking rhetorical questions is very similar to what God did in the end of Job. When Job is experiencing all this pain and suffering, and he meets God face to face, and God says, Where, were you there when I shaped the earth's foundations? Who shut up the seas behind its doors? Have you ever given order to the morning? God is asking Job to understand the greatness and the power and the un understandability of who God is. And so while the context, our context in hearing these questions may be different, the experience is the same. You know, isn't that why we kind of come to church anyways? Because we want to experience God. We want to know him more. We want to meet him here. And so we can ask ourselves kind of more updated questions to try to understand God's experience. In the chaos of life, do you ever feel an unexpected peace that just couldn't be explained? In the midst of your anger and fear, did you ever feel a calm that you know you couldn't create on your own? In the midst of your deepest loneliness, did you ever feel a deep, unexpected experience of love? If God is stirring up any responses within you to these questions, then you have experienced his presence. And even if there wasn't a stir up, God is standing behind you with his arms open, ready to give you such an experience. As I was preparing for this, of course, I was brought to my own experiences with God. And you know, when I was first in college, I was a nominal Christian. I did what I felt like had to be done. I checked off the right boxes. Um, and so I went to campus ministry because I believed that was kind of the thing you were supposed to do, right? A good Christian goes to Christian clubs. Uh, and so I, I would go to the meetings, and it was a little off campus, so I would drive down. But when I was there, I noticed that everyone else there, a lot of the people there had something. Something that I liked, something I wanted, but something I just couldn't explain. 
But the curiosity about it was enough to have me keep coming back and to keep trying to figure out what it was. I later learned that was a relationship with Christ. But so I kept going, and it was after one campus ministry meeting, which was honestly a fairly uneventful meeting in the meeting itself, but I was driving back up to campus, the five-minute drive, and I was just kind of idly flipping through radio stations. You know what you had to do before you had all your music on your phone. And I don't remember, I landed on a Christian station, and I don't remember the name of the station, I don't remember the song that was playing, I don't even remember the specific lyrics. But I remember the message that the lyrics communicated. And it was talking about how Jesus was hanging on a cross. And what put him there was his love and that he was willing to die because of how much he cared for me. And even though I grew up in the church, even though I had probably heard that same message thousands and thousands of times, something clicked. And I lost it. And I could not stop shaking. And fortunately, I was... I was pulling into my parking spot as this happened because I was bawling um, and crying in a way that I never really cried before. And I didn't really cry at that point. But God had just placed in me this realization of every point he had been with me in my life and how everything I was doing was all leading up to him telling me that he wanted a relationship with me. And the only way I could respond, it was almost instinctive, was just praying and asking God, I want to know more. I don't want to forget this moment. I don't want to forget this experience. Help me to know what to do. Help to guide me along in life. And so that moment was one of the main moments when I experienced God. And my life changed radically from that point on. And I think some may have a similar experience, a moment where we can think back and we know our life changed because we experienced the love of a God that could not be explained away. For some, maybe it's a bunch of smaller moments, but it was the same effect. We know the love of a God that we cannot explain away. For others, maybe we haven't had that moment. You don't really understand what I'm talking about, but you know you want it. And so you come here trying to find it, and I urge you to ask God for it because he always responds. And so we can sit here hearing this passage, hearing God reminding the Israelites of what he'd done in his life, and we think of our own moments. We can ask that question, how have we experienced God? And we know our lives have never been the same since. And so often I have a very analytical mind, and so I sit in that moment, and I feel really good for five minutes, and then my brain says, so what? What do we do next? How do we respond to that? Uh, and so as we do, we return to the passage. And so verses 5, 6, and 7 show us the typical human response to being in God's presence. See, we see here the mention of the islands, and actually the islands probably referred to a group of people who lived on the islands. And they were known as great craftsmen and great artists, but they were also known to rely on idols and other gods other than the true gods. And so when the Bible references these people, it's referencing about their experiences with the presence of God. And so at first, this experience sounds very positive. Everyone is helping each other. Neighbors are doing the right thing with each other. Craftsmen and goldsmiths are working together to make beautiful pieces of art. In a way, we think this, this is what it should look like. This is how humans should do it. But then we realize the sad truth that's present in that reality, that they have to do good work because they have no one to fall back on. Their idols are worthless. They don't have a true, loving, and powerful God that they know has their back. And so all that they have is what they can produce and what they can create. And it is astonishing how quickly that ugly truth can appear in our own lives. We have this amazing experience with God, and it so quickly turns into the laundry list of what I have to accomplish to be a good Christian. I have to go to church every week. I have to read my Bible every morning. I have to pray without ceasing. I have to love without ending. I have to forgive brothers. I have to share my faith with people I don't even know. It's quickly easy to become overwhelmed with the life of a Christian 
because our innate response is to rely on our strength and what we can do. And so when our focus is set on accomplishing the tasks before us, we have a tendency to push God right out of the picture, to forget somehow that amazing and earth-shaking experience of God that we had in the beginning of all of this. And the produce is often fear. And I face regularly, as I'm sure many of you do, that fear of not being good enough of not being a true Christian, of knowing we need to replace it with something. And when we have that fear of the weight of the world on our shoulder, it's easy to freeze. And so the response is, we got to take time to slow down. This passage is reminding us that when life gets too busy, when life gets too heavy, we have to freeze. We have to find the silence, and we have to experience God because in God's presence, we experience who he is. But how do we respond? You know, it's good to know we need those times of silence, but what more is there? And then it's in God's presence that we experience his promises. We see this in the rest of the passage of Isaiah, 8 to 29. And again, we see these kind of collection of poems that we don't want to analyze to death, but it invites us into this feeling of understand who God is. You see, in verse 8, there is a but, and that is a huge but. I know normally you're not supposed to talk about huge buts in sermons, but it's so significant because it shows a contrast between what life is like without God on our own, in our own power, and what life is like with a relationship with God and a relationship with Jesus. And so the following two verses, 8 and 9, and even, you know, a lot of 10, shows who Israel is. And there's many common denominators in this passage. They were chosen by God. They're to serve God. They were gathered by him. Again, it says they were chosen. That's probably pretty important. In short, Israel are the people who experienced the presence of God. And these verses also shows that God's presence is not a passive experience. It wasn't something we felt once, we had good feelings about, and then we just do whatever we want. It's God's active strength, his active power, his active fighting in our life, knowing that there is nothing that can stop it. And so verse 10 shows us the active nature of God's presence. Do not fear. If you notice when I was reading through the scripture, that probably showed up a good 10 times at least. And whenever something shows up that much, it's important. Do not be afraid. What does it mean not to fear? It's a lot easier to say than it is to put it into our lives, isn't it? What does it mean to not be afraid? It's to know that God is in control. And so verse 10 does provide some explanations about why they're not to, to be afraid. God gives three promises. It's to strengthen, that he will strengthen the Israelites, that he will help the Israelites, and that his hand, the hand that created the universe, will uphold them. And so these three promises reveal the intensity of God's strength. Yet what really stands out to these promises is a word that doesn't show up in our English translation, but it's present in the original languages, and it's this little word, ah, uh, just, just two, two letters, and it means, really? It's used to show the unexpected nature of a sentence, and it shows up three times, once in each of those promises. So as we read this passage with that really in mind, we see that it's saying, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Whether or not you believe it, I will strengthen you. I will even help you. I will even uphold you with my righteous hand. You see, that word, present three times, reveals the complete and absolute radical nature, unexpectedness of what God is promising. That no matter what the Israelites do, no matter how many times they have failed, and as we've seen in the Bible, they have failed, that God is there and he's got their back. 
And so, you know, we remember, we can, and the series of poems keep showing up to show this reality, and we can tie the man to the chair, and we can beat it up, and there's analysis we can do to try to get the feel of that. But we don't want to miss what this passage is screaming at us. God has a plan. God has promises for each and every one of our lives, and God has the strength to do it. And that is not just the truth in this passage. That is the truth in all of Scripture and in all of our lives. God had a plan when he called Moses, and he was stronger than Sarah's barrenness. God had a plan when he called David, and he was stronger than David's weakness that he showed many times. God had a plan when he called Israel, and he was stronger than their disobedience. God had a plan when he loved us on the cross, and he was stronger than any disobedience we could dream up. He was stronger than any pain of hanging on the cross. He was stronger than anything the enemy could throw at us. When God makes a promise, nothing can get in its way. And the whole purpose of not only this passage, but I would even argue the whole book of Isaiah is that God promises he will always be present in your life. Always. And so I have a refugee friend. Um, as Pastor Eric mentioned, I work with Warm, so I work with a lot of refugees. And I have a friend who shared his story. And I want you to imagine that you're, you wake up and you hear the sound of gunshots in your village. And you don't know what's going on, so you have to run. And you run to the woods to seek safety. And you find your family there, and you begin this long journey of trying to travel to safety because you know your village isn't safe. And so if you don't find food, if you don't find water, you don't eat, and you don't get to drink. But finally, you make it to, your, uh, to, to safety, to a refugee camp where you can stay, and you have to begin life all over again. And so you restart your life. You find your family. At and then you get to, to here, you get to come to America and try to find safety and refuge there. But it means you have to in, start over all over again. And this is my friend John's story. But when you hear him tell it, it's amazing. Because he, he goes through all of that, and then he gets to the end. And again, there's another big but. He says, but God was with me. God was with me when the bullets didn't hit me. God was with me when all my family made it to the woods and we were together. God was with me when we found food, we found water. God was with me when I got to the camp, and God is with me now in America with the people and the friends he's given me and with the opportunities I have to do. That is some insane faith. That I don't even know if I could have that level of faith, but that is a man who experienced the presence of God in his life. And he knows that he doesn't have to do anything, that there is no situation that is going to drive a wedge between him and God working out what he has always planned to happen. You see, there's no, when listening to this sermon, there's no magic bullet response. Um, there's no one thing we can do to know we're always going to be doing it right. Even being in relationship with God doesn't mean that we're not going to face hardship. The Israelites faced much, they faced exile after this. But it's knowing that God's promises will never end. And in each situation, we always have an advocate and a friend we can turn to. Our reality is that we are never alone and we are never forced to rely on our own power. And so the Israelites were in a time of chaos and suffering, yet God is reminding them that he has an amazing work in store for them. And I think that's something we've heard a lot about, the restoration of his people. And even though we are in the midst of chaos and suffering, God has the same restoration in store for us. Because in his presence, we glimpse his promises. 
And so we're left with kind of a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings and wondering, how does this affect our lives? Because there's one last part that this scripture hints at and that Acts 2 hints at, and that's why I asked Pastor Eric to include it, and it's the fact that in God's presence, we're given a choice. You know, to demonstrate this, I do want to fast forward to that Acts 2. We're cutting through a lot of the Bible, but it's okay. We'll go back. We'll read there. We'll get it. But Acts 2 is the story of the birth of the church. You know, everything we're able to do now was all because of this moment happened. And it all starts with the disciples gathered in one room with prayer. It all started with the disciples having an expectation that they would encounter God's presence. If they didn't think that, none of the church would be around. But you know what? God's presence came. And it came in an amazing way that sometimes I wish I could have seen this rustling of wind and these weird tongues of fire. But beyond all that amazing imagery and this amazing moment was God's presence. It was the disciples realizing all the times in their life when Jesus was looking after them when God had a plan for them, when God was walking hand in hand to bring them where they were. And the disciples in that moment had a choice. You see, if we think back in the Old Testament and a lot of the New Testament, whenever angels appear or God's presence appear, there's always one phrase that keeps showing up. Does anyone remember what it is? With fear and trembling. But this is, Acts 2 is one of the few places there is no fear, and trembling, because Jesus restored that relationship. And so when they saw God, they could choose to rely on their own power, in which case, tongues of flame, having to go out and speak a language you don't know, I would be afraid. I would be trembling. But they decided the other choice, to trust in God's promises and to trust in God's plan. And so each of us has that moment, many, many moments, probably thousands of moments in our lives where we have those type of Acts 2 moments. There may not be the wind and and the tongues of fire, but God is giving us a choice where we can either rely on doing things our own way and our own strength, or we can just trust him and see what happens. I want to kind of wrap up with one last story, and it's the story of this church um, where there was this pastor. He was fresh out of seminary. He moved in, and as he was describing this church, he says it's one of the most miraculous churches you're going to see. You know, the lawn is always nice cut down. The paint is fresh. He's like, guys in their 70s are up on ladders cleaning out the gutters. This church has a lot of pride in being and a lot of pleasure in being who they are, the church. And so as this pastor was here, he said he was working on helping people discover their spiritual gifts. And so he had different Bible studies and different opportunities to learn about how God is using them in lives. Uh, And so after doing this for a few weeks, this pastor, his name is Donna, talks about how one of his parishioners came up to him. And he came up really emotional, really energizing. He says, Donna, I know what you're doing here. He says, you're trying to change things. He's like, I have been here for 50 years. I've built those cabinets. He's like, I've laid this floor with my bare hands. He's like, and I know what you're doing. You're trying to make me a minister. And then his whole demeanor changed as he broke into tears. And he says, I may have a few gifts that have been overlooked. You see, that man had his own Acts 2 moment. He had his own encounter with God where he realized he didn't have to do tasks to earn God's favor. He realized he didn't have to be afraid. He just had to be present. He just had to have those moments of silence with God. And so as we take all of this passage, all of Acts 2, everything that's been said before, all of our emotions and all of our thoughts, There's no one application here to respond. I wish there is, I love the easy sermons where it's like, forgive people. Okay, check, I can do that. But each of us needs to find that next step that God is inviting us to. 
I can say with 100% certainty, 110% certainty that God here has an amazing idea in store for each and every one of you. And he has something in particular that he has each of you wanting to experience and to understand. And we're each at different stages in our journey, so that looks different for some. Maybe you're just struggling to get by. And maybe your next step is to just take the next step. It's to just keep getting by, to knowing that God is there and God doesn't forsake you in those hard things. For others, maybe you don't know who God is. Maybe you're listening to the sermons each week. Maybe you want to know what it's like that we're all talking about. Maybe your next step is to just ask God to reveal himself to you. Maybe it's to go to Pastor Eric or to go to someone in your church who you know knows Jesus and just say, I don't know what's going on. Help me. For others, maybe God has a surprise in store for you. Maybe he's placed someone specifically in your life so you can love them, so you can give them that encounter with God that has so transformed your own life. The reality is that as we do this, there's going to be times when we feel unequipped, when you feel like you may make a fool of yourself, yet that, that is the time that we remember this isn't on our own strength. Don't be afraid. Because we have God's earpiece in, don't we? We have the reality. We know the end of the story. We know that God's love died on a cross for us. And so we're going to sing as our response song the song, He Is. And I present that to us as an invitation for each and every one of us as we listen to remember your encounter with He who is. Remember that He loves you so much. He's came just to you so that you can experience that love personally. Not just hear about it on a Sunday morning, but experience. So let me pray for us as we go through the rest of our service. God, this is the day that you have made, and let us rejoice in it, God. I thank you for each and every person here who you have brought for a reason, whom you love, whom you guide, whom you have amazing plans for. And I just pray that you help each of us to find our next step, our next yes that we can say to you, and I pray that as we feel those feelings of fear and not knowing what it is, God, that we just have that strength and that ability to pause and to rest in you. And so I thank you, God, that this is possible. I thank you that you died on us, and I rejoice the new reality and the new life that is possible only in you. And so I thank you, and I pray in your name, Jesus.